I want to look at the smallest possible value that you can get for the largest eigenvalue of the sum. Okay, so I go over all of my possible ways of doing these things. I look at the largest eigenvalue, and I want that to be as small as possible. Um, such a quantity appears in numerous contexts, as we'll soon see. Uh, and a lot of my recent work has been concerned in understanding upper bounds for this exactly this theta. So one example, um, so if G1 and G2 are graphs with adjacency matrices A1 and A2, then I can take the union of these two graphs, it just puts the edges there where the edges weren't. Um, and what happens to the adjacency matrices, you just add them together. Okay. On the other hand, I could have permuted the vertices of this and then done a union. Right? So here I have the blue thing going like this and the green thing up there. That would have been a different addition of adjacency matrices. It would be the first one plus some permutation matrix <coughs> conjugating the second one. Okay? So if you look at all of the possible ways that you can permute this matrix, this is, you can consider it to be a random matrix. Um, and it turns out if A1 and A2 are regular bipartite graphs, then if you project uh, A1 and your random A2 orthogonal to the all ones vector, then what's left, if you minimize that thing, then you get a very good spectral gap, which is typically what you want to do in uh, spectral graph theory. Um, there's also this concept of spectral discrepancy. So if you have positive semi-definite matrices a1 through an, that all sum to the identity, then you can imagine giving ai to player one, or you could give ai to player two, depending on which one wanted it. Um, and then theta of a1 through an is going to give you the fairest partition. Right? It's going to give you the, the matrices that have all of its eigenvalues as close as possible, as, as close to each other as possible. Um, and I should say that this sum to identity is not a huge deal. Like you can uh, account for that by just multiplying by the square root of the inverse. Um, but really, the way I would like to try to bound theta is using the probabilistic method. Um, and the idea is that if I can show that the probability that lambda max of this sum is less than t is greater than 0, that means somewhere there exists one of these guys that, has, that does that. And there are numerous techniques for bounding such quantities. For example, there's matrix Chernoff bound. So just one let. Let A1 through AN be positive semi-definite matrices with this upper bound on the operator norm and some known value of the lambda max of the expected sum. And what you get is that the probability that lambda max is greater than or equal to some constant times this thing is less than or equal to m times some function of stuff. Um, the fact that this m here is going to be really that's all that's important. Um, here's matrix Bernstein. So now instead of having um, uh, lambda max of the sum of the of the expect sum of the expected matrices, we instead have the operator norm of the sum of the expected squared matrices. Um, and you get some exponential bound, but there's this m in here again. Uh, and here's matrix hufting, which is uh, instead you have some upper bound on what the squared matrices are it's in the uh, positive semi-definite uh, order. And again, you have this m. You have this m because if the matrices are diagonal, you have yeah, well, you're a slide ahead. But. Um, and really, there's this master tail bound, which um, implies all the previous bounds. Um, and it's not obvious that the m is there, but the, the m is there. Um, and so what do all of these things have in common? They bound this. These are all concentration bounds, essentially. And all of the bounds depend on the dimension. And there's a bad seed that causes all this to happen. I mean, so if you are a probability person, you don't consider this to be important because the bad seed is sort of something that you never really care about anyway. But if you are trying to get bounds on things that happen for all situations, the fact that one bad seed is there like screws up all of your bounds. Um, 
So let's define A1 through AN to be one of the n elementary diagonal matrices with uniform probability. Right? So you have one at each of these things with uniform probability. This becomes a balls and bins problem. So it's clear that the smallest you can get the maximum eigenvalue to be is 1, because you would just pick 1 for each of the possible things. But you get screwed up because the probability that lambda max of AI is greater than or equal to some log n over log log n is actually quite high. And this is going to skew your distribution. Um, and if you look at calculate what the master tail bound gives, it gives you exactly this. It says that theta of a1 through an is less than or equal to log n over log log n. Um, so, so this n sort of this m has to be there. Um, so I would like to do better. Um, so similar examples will show that any sufficiently generic bound that asserts lambda max is greater than or equal to t with high probability will depend on the dimension. But fortunately, for our purposes, high probability is suboptimal, right? I mean, if I'm telling you that something is happening with sub, with high probability, then my bound is somewhere around here. Whereas if all I need to do is show that something exists, it would be better if my bound was way down here. So that's what we're going to try to do. But to do so, we're going to need to find a way to capture low probability events. And here, low probability means exponentially small, small but still positive. And before this work, uh, there, as far as I know, there were no ways of doing this. You either had concentration bounds or you couldn't find anything. Uh, so we're going to try and find something that's not a concentration bound. Um, and we're going to use a method that we developed called interlacing families. Uh, and I just want to give a quick review in case people haven't seen this. Um, so the key idea is to switch from random matrices to random polynomials. So for any self-adjoint matrix, you instead of looking at the maximum eigenvalue, you take the characteristic polynomial and you look at the maximum root. That's not anything all that exciting. But it gets more exciting when you start doing random things. Um, so the probability that your lambda max is less than or equal to t is less than t is going to be the probability that your uh, maximum root is less than t. And so this suggests studying random characteristic polynomials. Um, but we're going to need to have a way to compare the roots of a collection of polynomials with the roots of the average, which in general is not possible. Right? When I add matrices together, like, there's no guarantee that their roots are even going to be real afterwards, let alone you know, comparable to what the original, matrices, the original polynomials were. Um, but we have what we call a, a separation lemma. And it says that if you have a collection of polynomials, and an interval st, such that all of, the p, all of the polynomials have the same sign at one end of the interval, and all of the polynomials have the same sign at the other end of the interval, and all of them cross the real axis at one point in that interval, then when you sum them up, that is going to have exactly one crossing in that interval. And furthermore, that crossing is going to lie in between the crossings of two of your polynomials that were there in the first place. And the proof is not so hard. I can do it by a picture. So here, all of the polynomials are positive. Here, all of the polynomials are negative. So somewhere in between, it has to be 0. And that's where the root is. And now if you look at where the root is, this is a bunch of polynomials that sum up to 0. So some, at least one of them has to be greater than or equal to 0, and at least another has to be less than or equal to 0, and those two will be the ones that bound that give you root bounds on each side. Um, and fortunately, polynomial theory gives us a nice characterization of this. Um, it says that if polynomials have all of their d roots separated, so there are these intervals where the, each one has exactly one root, this is equivalent to saying that every polynomial in the convex hull of these poly Every polynomial in the convex hull of the original polynomials has d real roots. So this essentially becomes a condition where you can understand this summation property based on showing that a bunch of different polynomials have all real roots. So I'm going to say that p forms an interlacing star with a collection qi. If the qi are all degree d monic polynomials, the convex combinations of the qi are real rooted, and p is some convex combination of the qi. And what's the point? The point is if p forms an interlacing star with the qi's, then for any root that I'm interested in, 
maybe the second to the last, second to the highest root. I can always find a QI that has a second highest root, which is less than or equal to the second highest root of the sum. And I can find a QJ, which has a second highest root, which is greater than or equal to the second highest root of the sum. Um, and to make this idea more versatile, we can iterate. So I can you know, start building uh, these interlacing sums. And then from the things that are up here, I build an interlacing sum on top of it, an interlacing star on top of it. Um, and these big trees of polynomials, I'm going to call an interlacing family. Um, and what is the punchline? The punchline is that every interlacing family contains leaf nodes, p leaf one and p leaf two, that straddle the p whatever root you're interested in of the expected polynomial. And uh, the proof is essentially just walking down the tree. You find the one that you like. Um, you sh know that these two have a common interlacer, so one of them is bigger than that root, and the other one's smaller. You pick the one that you're interested in, say the smaller one, and then the next level, those two have a, a common interlacer, so you keep going down. Um, and in the rank one case, a bound on any root can be obtained. So um, if a1 through an are random, independent, rank one positive semi-definite matrices, then these polynomials, determinant of xi minus sum over i ai, where you go over all the support in each of the ones, form an interlacing family. And in particular, this expected characteristic polynomial gives you a bound on the largest root. On, gives you a bound on the existence of one of your polynomials that has at least this, large of, at least this small of a root. Um, for higher rank matrices, a bound on theta can be obtained by rankifying them. Um, and this is a result of Michael Cohen very recently, which showed essentially that the way that if you have a higher rank matrix behaves, you can pretend that they're not really higher rank matrices. You can pretend that you have these rank one matrices that are in expectation the same as those higher rank matrices. And whatever bound you get from those rank one matrices essentially exists for this, for your higher rank matrices. Um, the issue is that it. Uh, I mean, the construction of the guy which you go down the tree is a very, uh, is a ready thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not, so the statement is they exist. They exist. It's not the statement that a random guy is a problem. Uh, no, no, no. It says that, so this, right, so this was defined to be the minimum over all of the things inside the support of these guys. So this, is, um, so this is a fixed thing that we can find. Um, and essentially what Michael Cohen showed was that you, if you are interested in the maximum root, you essentially the, the rank one case is the worst case you can be in. So, um, but unfortunately, this doesn't work for other roots. Um, so now let me get to what I'm going to call a free Poisson paradigm. So what is the Poisson paradigm? So this comes from Alon and Spencer. And it says, when x is the sum of many rare indicator mostly independent random variables, and lambda is the expected value of x, we would like to be able to say that x is close to a Poisson distribution with mean mu, uh, mean lambda. And if we can do this, we call this rough statement the Poisson paradigm. And it's useful in combinatorics for showing <laughs> that uh, things exist with small probability. So the hope is that maybe we can do something similar for matrices. So what are our conditions? So we have that x here is a sum of many. OK, so before we used to have rare indicator random variables. I'm going to have to switch that to non-negative and small expectation. That's not a huge, it's actually a generalization, but it's not a huge uh, move in any direction. Um, so I need x to be a sum of many non-negative random variables. I need each xi to have small expectation. I need the xi to be mostly independent. And then what the hope is, is that x behaves like a Poisson distribution with this particular mean. Okay. So in order to move this to matrix matrices, I'm going to need to move to non-commutative probability. And if you've never seen that before, you can imagine non-commutative probability as taking your distribution and putting it on the diagonal of a matrix. 
and then sort of giving your matrices rotations and then seeing what happens. So a classical distribution ends up being an eigenvalue distribution. A random variable ends up being the linear operator that has that distribution. Uh, your expectation ends up being the normalized trace. And then having a non-negative distribution becomes a positive semi-definite matrix. So we can essentially just replace these things right away. I'm going to have to have x be a sum of many positive semi-definite matrices. Each matrix is going to need to have a small trace. Now I'm with this xi are mostly independent, and then the x behaves like a Poisson distribution. So what does dependence mean? Well, um, so non-commutative probability has uh, an, a type of independence that it calls free independence. So for two matrices A and B, the eigenvalues of F of A, B depend on the eigenvalues of A, the eigenvalues of B, and then how the dot products of the corresponding eigenvectors associate with each other. And the quick and dirty way of explaining free independence is that these should not depend on the eigenvectors at all. Like all the dot products, you sort of want all the dot products between these things to be equal. Um, and it's sort of the same as saying that f depends only on the marginal distributions. And this is kind of what it looks like in two dimensions. The problem is that it doesn't really happen, especially in matrices. I mean, you can't, if you try, you can't find an orthonormal basis and another orthonormal basis, all of which the dot products are the same. Um, uh, but what you, yes. Uh, no, I think you, you really want them to be as not, you want to be as far away from commuting as possible. You sort of want them all to be some, well, okay, so in the infinite limit, this is going to be zero, right? But as, if you were in a finite dimension, what you sort of want is for them to be all as close to equal and I guess 1 over k, probably 1 over m. So properties of this, the identity is freely independent from everything. Uh, randomly rotated matrices are asymptotically free. So if you spin these matrices around and then let the dimension go to infinity, what you get acts like a, a free random variable. And in some sense, these things are supposed to be as far away from commuting as possible. So you know what it means to be a commuting matrix. It means that you're, you have the same basis. These bases should not line up in any way, and they should be equally bad in all directions. Uh, so whether or not that exists, uh, up for argument in the finite dimension, it's not really. I mean, it doesn't really exist. Um, but here I'm hoping to get mostly freely independent anyway, so maybe I can get away with something. Uh, so now I need to understand what Poisson would mean in this scenario. And why would this behave like a, in the original one, why would it behave like a Poisson distribution? Well, if the original variables were truly independent, then this would essentially be the law of small numbers approximation. right? When you um, let n go to infinity and np goes to some fixed lambda, your binomial distribution approximates your Poisson distribution. So we're going to do the same thing. So we need to know how the eigenvalue distribution of a plus b works when a and b are freely independent. And probably the easiest way to see this is to look at the convergence of moments as the uh, uh, dimension gets large. So as a and b, if a and b are a sequence of matrices with corresponding distributions, then the sequence of the kth moments of expected value of the trace of a n plus q b n q star to the k converges to some number. And those, there's a unique distribution which has that number, which has those moments. And that distribution is called the free convolution. So it's sort of the same as adding two random variables together. Um, and if you let mu1 through mu n have Bernoulli p eigenvalue distributions, which is exactly what we had before, then you take the n times free convolution, where you let n go to infinity, but then you let np go to lambda, just like we did before. Then you get a, con then you get a distribution called the free Poisson distribution. And it's this mu np. It has this um, uh, density. But for our purposes, all that we're really going to care about is the fact that mu mp is supported on this interval, 1 minus square root of 
lambda squared to 1 plus square root of lambda squared. I mean, is this more than just uh, solving inverse moment problem? If you do it in the usual way, you compute the moments, and you get the measure through the limit, and then you have to invert to find what the measure is as a function of the moment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so the, it's a fancy theory, but in the end, that's all it's doing. Oh, yeah, I'm not doing anything here. I, the, I'm not complaining. <laughs> So I'm not uh, claiming to have done any of this. So this is all. I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about Pavelski's theory. Yes, it's essentially you. Provide more than, uh, it gives you. It gives you a way to linearize. So it gives you the cumulant. So given a moment generating function, you can take a cum, You can turn it into a cumulant generating function. You just add those two cumulant generating functions, and then you go in the reverse order. Exactly. Um, but uh, you might have noticed that I called this mu mp. The reason I call it mu mp is that this uh, distribution existed, well, it was discovered long before free probability um, existed. Uh, and it was called in there the Marchenko Pastor uh, <coughs> distribution. And the way you would find it is by taking um, an m by n random matrix with iid normal entries. Uh, which is oftentimes called a Wishart matrix. And then you let m and n go to infinity in such a way that m over n goes to lambda. And then the empirical eigenvalue distribution of this, of 1 over n xx transpose, will converge to this Marchenko Pastor. So people are uh, well aware about them. Um, sorry. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that the support depends on this ratio m over n. Doesn't depend on n. Doesn't depend on m, which is something that we were having issues with before. So now, if you recall our inspiration, when x is the sum of many rare indicator, mostly independent random variables, blah blah blah, we can actually turn this into a statement that says, when x is the sum of n mostly free independent positive semi-definite m by m random matrices, we would like to say that x is close to a free Poisson distribution with parameter n over m. That's what we would like to say. Uh, so what do I mean by mostly freely independent? Well, the theorem that we have is that if your expected um, matrix is some constant times the identity for all k, then the free Poisson paradigm holds. So this is close enough to being. So remember that in finite dimensions, the only things that were actually free are um, constant times the identity. Um, it turns out that being mostly freely independent is enough to be to just have your expectation be that. Um, and if you recall our bad seed from before, define uh, we had a m through a n be one of the n elementary diagonal matrices. The master tail gave us something like log n over log log n, and our Poisson paradigm is going to give us one plus two over square root of n plus one over n. So something extremely close to what the the right answer is, and um, and not by coincidence. Um, so okay, so now we have some sort of bound, right? I, you know, we did this method of interlacing polynomials. I told you we could bound this. Uh, the we could show that there exists something that has a, a largest eigenvalue that was at least as good as the expected characteristic polynomial, but that doesn't really do you much good unless you know what the roots of the expected characteristic polynomial are, for instance. And there's no guarantee that those would actually be any good. So those are two valid questions. And such questions prompted us the development of what we call finite free probability. Um, and I should say that this can actually be used for arbitrary self-adjoint matrices. The problem is that we don't have any um, method of interlacing polynomials that allows us to translate it to anything. So you can make calculations. It just doesn't help you very much. Uh, so what is the finite free additive convolution? So let p of x be a polynomial with roots ai, and q of x be a polynomial with roots bi. Then p plus q of x is the expected value over sigma of this product of x minus ai minus b sigma i. So it's sort of a permanent of um, uh, rank 2 matrix. And it's worth noticing that, or it's worth me telling you that this can be obtained without factoring. So you don't actually need to know the roots. Otherwise, you'd be in big trouble, uh, theoretically. Um, you can actually do this str strictly from the coefficients. Um, and what is the relation to random matrices? 
well, if A and B were M by M self-adjoint matrices and these were their characteristic polynomials, then this uh, additive convolution would essentially be taking the characteristic polynomial of the random sum between them, uh, where Q now you can take Q to be a Haar measure over orthogonal matrices. You can take it to be a Haar measure over unitary matrices. You can take it to be uniformly distributed signed permutation matrices. It's essentially the part of random matrix theory which is independent with respect to beta. These are the, the elementary characteristic, the elementary symmetric polynomials Where don't change. The, the Lee Pell, the, uh, Yang Lee theorem fit into this? Do we expect the value of you take all plus minus one in the signs, or is that how it's the difference? So that is a different story, I think. It doesn't fit into this? It doesn't, I, I don't have a way of fitting it into this story. I mean, it's, that, seem, that seems more of like a covering argument. Like, that seems more of a lifting argument, right? I mean, that's... But instead of permutations, you're taking uh, the original thing, and then you're taking a plus minus one at each side. Yeah. The expectation of all the plus minus ones. Right. It should, but it, there's a diff, there's a better explanation okay. of, of what's happening here, which we'll get so to. So your that, yeah, that sorry. convolution will depend upon the group you're averaging with. No, all of these will be the same. All this same. will all give you they will all give you the same polynomial. This is essentially a product of the symmetries of the signed permutation matrices. So anything that contains that we'll give you the same, give you the same thing. Um, and essentially, these are, if you look at the statistics that you get from beta ensembles, these are exactly the statistics that don't depend on beta. Everything else will depend on beta in some way. These are global statistics. This is just the density of states. Correct. Uh, and what is the relation to free probability? Well, if A and B are M by M self-adjoint matrices, and A and B are freely independent random matrices with the same eigenvalue distributions, then if you sort of, you know, supercharge your uh, polynomial thing by adding more and more roots, then what you get, the root distribution converges to the eigenvalue distribution of this thing. Yes? It may be obvious, I don't know, but it, this uh, box sub m yes. is, it, is it play nice with Fourier transform? Uh, it plays much nicer with something else, which we'll see in a second. That, that's a good question. Uh, it, uh, yes, it plays very well with the Stilchis transform. Um, but it also has a very uh, unique algebra with it that makes it easy to calculate these things. So it's, um, and the other thing that's worth mentioning is that um, we also have a bound that says that, OK, so we know that this quantity, the eigenvalues converge to the eigenvalue distribution of this. We also know that for, for any finite m, the maximum root of this lies inside the spectrum of the, of the uh, free convolution. So in a way, if you understand how the free convolution is acting, that's going to tell you, what you're, uh, is going to tell you a good upper bound on what uh, you can expect from, from this. Um, and we have a conjecture that the max root is actually increasing in k. We don't know how to show that. Um, here is a graph of. Could you go back a, a sorry. few slides? What is this? No, that was before that one. But when you have the p k's, yeah, that, what, what, are the, what are the p k's and the q k's? Uh, p to the k just means that you're repeating every root k times. Right? You're raising, so this is p it. to the k okay, power. Yeah. And it's, a, it's the usual tensor thing that you do to, to bump up the, the degree, I mean the uh, dimension without changing the distribution. Um, so here is a plot of p plus q squared, that's the blue one. And here the yellow one is p squared plus q squared. Um, and by looking at it, you can just sort of come up with a number of conjectures that we don't know how to show. For instance, one we believe is always less than or equal to the other. Um, and we also believe that the, um, the roots of the yellow one majorize the roots of the blue one, uh, which would give you actually a lot more information than we already know about the, the largest root being on the inside. Um, 
So it was mentioned that you know you would like this operation to play nice with something because otherwise it's just sort of an operation that you can write down, you can't really do anything with. Um, it turns out it plays extremely nicely with differential operators. So if L is a linear differential operator, sum over constants times a derivative, then you can essentially move this differential operator anywhere within the plus sign that you want. So you, the, if you wanted L of the convolution, that's L of P convolved with Q, which is the same as P convolved with L of Q. So this gives an easy way to calculate these things. So if P and Q are linear differential operators, so that P of X is P applied to this thing, and Q of X is big Q applied to that thing, then to solve this, you just need to figure out what P, big P is and big Q is and apply them both to X to the M. So this is actually not particularly hard to calculate. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's isomorphic to Rx um, modulo x to the m plus 1, although we have no underway of you know, actually using that fact. Um, uh, so here's an example. The Hermite polynomials are defined as uh, this thing. But the, for our purposes, the best way is to look at e to the minus partial squared over 2 applied to x to the m. So now if you look at what happens when you convolve a Hermite polynomial with another Hermite polynomial, you get yet another Hermite polynomial. And this is actually sort of the first glimpse of free probability. This is the finite version of a central limit theorem. So if a1 through an are m by m real symmetric matrices, such that um, this is the expected trace of a squared is 1 and the expected trace of a is 0, then when you add up these things a bunch of times and you normalize by square root of n, you converge to the roots of this Hermite polynomial. And for anyone who's done random matrix theory, it should not be a surprise that you converge to the Hermite polynomial. Because as m goes to infinity, the root distribution of the Hermite polynomial approaches the semicircle law, which is exactly the um, central limit theorem law in free probability. And in fact, most of the statistics that you understand about the semicircle law comes from this, the fact that the Hermite polynomials uh, converge in this way. Um, and the proof is not so hard. I mean, you turn all of these things into operators, and then you show in some limit that this uh, goes to e to the minus partial squared over 2 to the m minus 1. That's not all that exciting. Um, but you can do something similar. So a similar computation can be used in the free Poisson paradigm. So if p of x is x to the m minus 1 times x minus 1, this is what would happen if you had a rank 1 matrix. Um, then when you convolve it lambda m times, you get a Laguerre polynomial. And as m goes to infinity, the root distribution approaches the Marchenko-Pasteur law, which is exactly what we should expect. But sort of, you know, because these are like really famous polynomials that people seem to be very interested in the roots of, we can actually get extremely tight bounds, much better than you can get first order approximations because people are interested in such things. So yes, we knew from before that 1 plus square root of lambda squared was an upper bound, but we can, you know, get the next one or two or three terms usually of the um, of the asymptotic of the um, approximation. Uh, so this actually tells you, you know, if you combine this with the method of interlacing polynomials, it tells you that you can find these things that, that are you know, a substantial amount away from the border. Um, OK, so unfortunately, we can't assume that all polynomials have some you know, extensive literature telling you all of the, you know, where all of the roots lie. Um, and if you look at this max root operation, it's kind of horrible. I mean, essentially, the only thing you can say is the triangle inequality. Um, and that's extremely unstable. If you look at, say, p of x equals x to the m minus 1 times x minus 1, so m minus 1 roots at 0 and 1 root at 1, versus 1 root at 0 and m minus 1 roots at 1. So each of these have max root equal to 1. But then when you do the convolution, here the max root does not go up very much. It goes to 1 plus square root of 1 over m. But here, the max root goes up a lot. It goes up to almost 2, which is essentially what the, um, uh, the triangle inequality will tell you. 
So this is good and this is bad. Um, and the solution is to use a smoother version of the max root function. So for a real rooted polynomial, we define the alpha max to be the maximum root of p minus alpha p prime. Uh, so alpha equals 0 is the usual max root function, and it grows with alpha. And um, well, this is something about a barrier function that I don't want to talk about. Um, but we can get very good bounds on these uh, alpha maxes. So um, if p is a degree m real root of polynomial, then we can say that uh, the derivative of the alpha max is between 1 and essentially 2. Um, we can get bounds on p prime given p. And um, if you iterate this m minus 1 times, this sort of gives you, so this uh, alpha max of p minus the m alpha lives in between the expected value of your roots and whatever your largest root is. So it gives you some indication as to where you are. Um, and our main inequality is the, that um, if you look at the alpha max of p plus mq, this is less than or equal to the alpha max of p plus the alpha max of q minus m alpha. Um, and the proof uses previous lemmas and induction. Um, but if you apply this to our previous version, where um, before all essentially all we could say was that it's less than or equal to 2, here this bound now goes down to 1 plus 2 over square roots of m, which is much closer to 1, over, 1 plus 1 over square roots of m than 2 was. Um, and usually, if you do multiple convolutions, you actually do better than if you just do a few convolutions, because then you can do all of these convolutions at once as a function of alpha, and then optimize alpha at the end. So, um, so, so you don't get this issue of having you know, error at every stage. You sort of collect one error at the end, even though you're convolving a whole bunch of times. Um, and the reason that our main inequality is interesting is that if you look at this main inequality as k goes to infinity, like we did before, uh, this turns into an equality. Right? So this actually converges to what the R transform identity is for the free convolution. Um, and in particular, it implies that the Poisson paradigm is asymptotically sharp given the amount of information that you have. I mean, if if you have situations where there are uh, other possibilities that have the same expectations, then it may not be sharp, but it will be sharp for those expectations. Um, so what can we do with this? So these things imply ideas like restricted invertibility. So this is a theorem of uh, Borgan and Safriri. Uh, if v1 through vn are, are vectors with some of the vi, vi transpose or the identity, then what you want to do is you want to pick a subset of these things such that those, that subset is almost orthogonal to each other. And the question is, how close to orthogonal can it be? Well, it turns out it's directly that the worst case scenario is essentially the Marchenko-Pasteur uh, distribution. And so you can, get as, you can get slightly better than 1 minus square roots of k over m squared but asymptotically, you can't do any better. Um, the same sort of thing happens in spectral graph theory. If G1 is a D1 regular graph and G2 is a D2 regular graph, then if you look at the convolution of the matrices after you've projected out the, after you've, um, projected out the all ones matrix, then you can show that the lambda 2 of this sum is less than or equal to the max root of this thing. So this gives you good bounds. And this leads to a way of constructing deregular Ramanujan graphs as a union of de-randomly permuted perfect matching. This is essentially the, the way that we go about doing it. It's kind of a, uh, there's something being pushed under the rug here because. Uh, now avoiding the uh, so in this construction, no, we don't actually need that. So in this construction, I think it's more natural to describe it as free convolutions of, of finite measures. I mean, there were two ingredients before with the interlacing. Yeah. Plus the fact that the expected value yeah. of the random choice of plus minus yeah. was exactly something which had all those roots on the surface. But that, the reason that that did seemed to be a different reason than this one does. 
we don't have a new proof of the Li Yang theorem. We have a new proof of the existence of Ramanujan graphs. That and okay. So the other thing that's interesting about this is that this has been turned into an algorithmic construction, whereas we have no hope. I, I personally have no hope that the other one will be because you're essentially going to have to construct the uh, matching polynomial, and that's an NP-complete thing to do. So the fact that this was turned into a, an algorithmic construction seems to suggest that something very different is happening here. Um, so just to recap, we have a new way of capturing low probability events. And it seems to be useful when the Gaussian random matrix is sort of conjectured to be the worst case scenario. And then, um, so the method of interlacing polynomials we can use to show that uh, we can find something that has eigenvalues that meet some bound. And then using finite free probability, we can explicitly calculate those bounds. And all such bounds will be asymptotically tight, essentially because uh, free probability is, um, is the, the example of the tightness, whatever comes out of free probability. Um, that said, there's still a lot to learn. So we actually can say things about, about situations that are much farther from freely independent than, than what I just mentioned. So um, the furthest from freely independent thing that we can say is that if A1 through AN are independent random positive semi-definite matrices with the sum of the expected values equal to the identity, which is a much weaker situation than asking for each of those things to be something times the identity, then we can get this bound. And this bound, again, is asymptotically tight. It comes from the Marchenko-Pastor distribution, but we don't have a way of tying the analysis of this thing to that in the way that we do with the finite free probability. It's not captured, I believe, by the additive convolution. And it sort of suggests a need for like a, a multivariate extension of this, um, which would be very nice. Um, but as an example f of what uh, the types of theorems that you can prove from these things, uh, this is a theorem of Ackman and Weaver combined with um, sort of this uh, uh, rank oneification that Michael Cohen came up with. And it says that if A1 through AN are positive semi-definite matrices with the sum over AI is less than or equal to I. Here, the fact that it's less than or equal to I is essentially irrelevant. It just gives you some sort of scale to measure the traces with. Um, and the traces are small. Then for all values of T1 through TN, you can find a set of indices which is extremely close to this thing, to your convex, well, not really convex combination, but your uh, real. So if you imagined this as being a um, semi-definite program and this being a semi-definite program relaxation, what it's saying is that these things are always have something in the semi-definite program which is extremely close to the semi-definite program relaxation. And so it would be interesting to know whether there are applications of that to semi-definite programming. Um, another question that we've been struggling with for a long time is whether we can bound um, <laughs> the spectral norm for general self-adjoint matrices. So everything we, I've been telling you has been able to bound one root of the uh, one eigenvalue. Um, for a lot of applications, it turns out to be nice to be able to bound two of the eigenvalues, because if you're not positive semi-definite, then you actually care about whether there's a huge negative eigenvalue or not. Um, other questions that would be interesting, so can we get bounds in terms of norms other than the expected trace? Uh, bounds in terms of the Frobenius norm would be particularly interesting. My guess would be if you could find bounds in terms of Frobenius norm, you could probably solve Kolmloch conjecture, would be my guess. What the, conjecture? Kolmloch conjecture. Um, it's essentially this, in, except you're measuring in L2 rather than L1. Um, it's actually the diagonal case of this. Um, and then multivariate extensions would be nice, too. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, there are also an open set of applications that can be um, possibly taken from these. So apart from the additive convolution, we have multiplicative convolution. We have uh, an asymmetric additive convolution, if you're interested in singular values rather than eigenvalues. Um, we have this concept of additive and multiplicative Brownian motion. 
entropy, Fisher information theory, uh, Fisher information, and uh, very recently, um, uh, someone came up with a combinatorial theory of cumulants, which matches exactly what we're doing. Um, and if you have any experience with free probability, that's one of the sort of the unique things about free probability is that it has sort of this very combinatorial base as well as a very analytic base. And you can sort of do it in two different ways, and you get exactly the same thing. And he showed that uh, essentially um, that everything that you would want from a combinatorial theory like is, is here. So this is, I don't want to say this is the right theory because it's not unique, but it's one of the right theories. Uh, what, what, uh, what combinatorial theory are you referring to here? Uh, so this is like, uh, you know, they have this moment cumulant generating uh, formulas, and then you can show that, you know, you have these partially ordered sets, and you're summing over um, non-crossing partitions, uh, and, you know, that's what essentially your moment to cumulant transformation is doing. It's, you know, summing over non-crossing partitions, and then um, somehow you... It's actually very nice because it, in many ways, um, a lot of free probability, it's unclear what the correct generalization is in the analytic sense. But in the combinatorial sense, it's, sort of, it's usually pretty straightforward. And then you can figure out what the corresponding analytical thing is. Or, yeah. Um, and we haven't used any of these for anything, essentially. Um, although, uh, if you were at uh, Vadim Gorin's talk um, last week, uh, we've decided that there are noticeable similarities to the ideas that they use in discrete log gases. Um, so that might be some place to actually use this. Um, so thanks to the organizers, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much.